Well, good afternoon. Uh, today is April 3rd, 2023. One of my granddaughter's birthdays. Had to say that. Hey, uh, we look out and uh, we see some friendly faces out there, which is nice to see. Uh, some frowns, but that's okay. Uh, it's good to have you here today, and we hope you find your time well spent. Uh, today is uh, April 3rd, County Commission meeting, 3 o'clock, and uh, we'll call this meeting to order. We'll begin the meeting as we usually do with, uh, with a prayer. Uh, this is called a solemnizing prayer. If our chaplain will come forward, Chaplain Taylor, oh, he's already forward. He's, he's ready to pray. This is a solemnizing prayer. It's for the commissioners. It's not for you. You're welcome to listen in if you like. Uh, we ask him to come pray for us because we seek wisdom and those things that decisions we have to make for the community. We um, take that very seriously. And then following that, we'll have a Pledge of Allegiance. So commissioners, if you'll join me, we'll get started. Let's pray. Lord, we thank for this day provided for us, Lord. We thank for our county commissioners, Lord, in attendance today, Lord. And we thank you for all the time that they've took to prepare this meeting today. Pray you give them the wisdom they need today uh, as we meet now. And pray you bless them in a special way. Encourage their hearts, dear Lord. Thank for what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chaplain Taylor, for... Uh, for working hard to get here today. I know you've got some other commitments. Uh, additions and deletions from the agenda. The only thing I have, and I don't know if I need, I need to mention this. We do have one additional board appointment that came in. Uh, and what board was that? The last board. And that's, uh, Say that again, Steve Simpson. Okay, for I'm looking for. Yep, there it is, Scotch Irish Volunteer Fire Department uh, commissioners. All right, so thank you, Sarah. So just wanted to make you aware that that's in there. I don't know if we need to adjust the agenda at all for that. Uh, does anyone else have any additions or deletions? All right, hearing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 And then a uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, in a second. All right. All in favor say aye. aye. And then we've got anyone for public comment? Nope. All right. Now reports. Um, We have Micah Ennis is with us. Welcome, Micah. Uh, on behalf of Community Child Protection Team. Micah, would you like to come forward? All right. All right. Welcome. She said to be nice. Did Judy tell you to be nice? She did. Like, we're really rude all the time. No, no not at all. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Brown. I'm the executive director of Smart Start Rowan um, here in Salisbury, and we're an agency that serves children birth to five and their families, as well as all caregivers and teachers of young children. We, along, the, uh, along with the others that came with me today, um, are committed to laying the groundwork for success. And we try to make an impact early because we know that's when the most important um, development is going on in young children's lives. So our work with partners like the Health Department, DSS, and Terry Hess Child Advocacy Center is vital to the well-being of young children and the economic development of our community. So my work at Smart Start aligns very nicely with the work of the Rowan Community Child Protection Team. So Micah asked me to come and talk to you about the annual report from the child care community, the child community protection team, since I'm this year's chair. So you should have that report in your packet. 
It outlines the community child protection team task and their responsibilities regarding child health and well being. It also tells you that our team serves as the child fatality prevention team, meaning we review um, all Rowan County child fatalities and we look at recommendations on how to prevent those fatalities in the future. It tells you all of the team members from all kinds of child serving um, agencies in the community. And it also gives you data, case review information and needs identified. The last page of the 2022 annual report from the community child protection team lists recommendations for the community, as well as recommendations for you all, the board of commissioners that you typically approve each year, or you approve the report each year. So I'm gonna read those to you. Recommendation number one from the Rowan Child Community Protection Team, to issue a proclamation declaring the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. Recommendation number two, to accept and approve the annual report as presented um, in order to keep you all informed. Recommendation number three, to appoint new members of our team for mandated member positions when vacancies occur, which we don't have any to bring before you today. Recommendation number four, to encourage use of evidence-based practice models for agencies receiving county funding. Number five, to provide ongoing leadership efforts to ensure that the local agency collaboration um, leaders uh, support the community protocol for child abuse prevention. Number six, to support our team's review of the community protocol for child abuse prevention each year. And a new one this year, Judy, you'll like this one, is to consider the impact of economic supports on child abuse prevention in Rowan County. You have the public policy paper, I believe, in your packet too, that came from Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina in regards to um, economic supports and how they are used to really ultimately impact abuse and neglect in young children's lives. You're gonna hear more in detail from my community partner leaders that, that came with me about those particular types of economic supports. Examples are Medicaid, food and nutrition services, childcare subsidies, which my agency focuses on, and services to assist parents. So the child um, community protection team is committed in investing and exploring those types of investments. Do we need to get approval now of the report or after we're finished? Do you want? Because they're going to talk to you about. Yeah, let's wait till we're finished. Okay. So Sean Edmond is going to come up. He is the executive director of Terry Hess Child Advocacy Center, and he'll let you know about the great work that his team is doing at their agency. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about the Terry Hess Child Advocacy Center. The mission of the Terry Hess Child Advocacy Center is to serve the needs of children and families in Rowan County by providing a community-based center that utilizes best practices in prevention, as well as in the identification, investigation, prosecution, and treatment of child abuse. Most of us would like to think we live in a community where child abuse is not a problem. Sadly, that is not the case. In 2022, our CAC provided services to more children and families than ever in our 20 year history. This year, we are already on track to surpass that. In the first quarter of 2023, we have already provided over 650 therapy sessions for children who are the victims of child physical and sexual abuse. As we acknowledge Child Abuse Prevention Month, I wanna take a moment to tell you about a couple of the prevention strategies that we use here in Rowan County. The first is our school-based program, Stop Go Tell. This curriculum is taught in first and fifth grade classes throughout the county. In 2023, we have added some pre-K classes to this program and hope to expand that in the coming year. Stop Go Tell teaches children how to identify unsafe situations and how to build the skills necessary to get help if they are experiencing or witnessing abuse. We teach children to identify safe adults that they can talk to if they need help. These adults are they're superheroes, but if something unsafe is happening, we teach children that they have the power to be a superhero too. They learn how to speak out and seek help. Another, another strategy we use is our positive parenting program. 
Triple P is designed to prevent, as well as treat, behavioral and emotional problems in children and teenagers. It aims to prevent problems in the family, school, and community before they arise and to create family environments that encourage children to realize their potential. In response to the growing number of children experiencing abuse and neglect, we are adding programs to our prevention strategy. The first is a program called W5 that focuses on how and when to report suspected child abuse. Many people do not know what to do when they encounter a child in this situation. W5 will give them the tools needed to get help for these children. Along these same lines, we're involved in a statewide initiative to create a single call center for child abuse reporting in partnership with 211. This single number will streamline the reporting process and you can call the same number in any county in North Carolina. The final addition is a therapy-based program called Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, or PCIT. PCIT is an evidence-based tra treatment program designed for caregivers and their young children ages two to seven who are experiencing social, behavioral, and or emotional difficulties. Research has proven time and again that PCIT decreases incidence of child abuse. We are very proud to be the first and only providers of this type of therapy in Rowan County. Many people ask me, why do people abuse children? There are a multitude of reasons, but one that is common in our area is economic insecurity. This is where we can use your help. The cost of living has skyrocketed over the last couple of years, and a lot of people are struggling to make ends meet. The level of stress this places on a family can be overwhelming, and unfortunately, some parents take out their frustrations on their children through abuse and neglect. Some families have even exploited their children through prostitution to make ends meet. This is human trafficking, which itself is another form of child abuse, and we have seen several cases of this in our county. The crimes committed against our children are unimaginable, and it is our duty to help these innocent lives to be the best of our ability and me to the best of our abilities and means. Today, I stand before you as a proud advocate for all children in Rowan County and kindly ask for your support in preventing and treating child abuse in this great community. Thank you for your time today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Rowan County's Health Director, Alyssa Harris. Before you go, Sean. Yes. <clears throat> um, so when we look at the perpetrators of, of um, especially sexual abuse, what's the ratio as far as knowing, a known person versus a stranger? 90%. 90% of abusers are known to the child. And then I just want to remind our commission friends here that uh, Triple P, which um, Sean talked about, is one of those things that we fund in our budget. So thank you, commissioners. We are very grateful for that. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I know, <laughs> if only I had heels on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit vertically challenged. Um, well, good afternoon, commissioners. You know, I come from that public health space, that public health background. We, we unfortunately have that Venn diagram of experiences of child maltreatment and neglect uh, and substance use and parenting. Uh, so we see this in public health that parental substance abuse is a serious problem affecting the well being of our children and families, uh, not just nationally, but here in Rowan County. Uh, and we know that poor outcomes for children of parents with substance use can be seen across development. Uh, in our 2021 Rowan County State of the County Health Report, the health department highlighted early child development after listening to you all and listening to the community as one of our key emerging issues that we'll be tracking um, just due to the number of alarming issues affecting our youngest and most vulnerable citizens. Um, we can see it at its most severe, the impact to our community and to our children um, in those submitted uh, community child protection team reports. The commissioners have heard me share opioid data specifically relating to plan of care for infants or plan of safe care for infants. Currently, 10% of our infants in Rowan County require a plan of safe care. This means that they are born and identified as being affected by substance use disorder, are experiencing withdrawal symptoms at birth, or have been diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. In Rowan County, uh, the health department also provides vital records. Uh, we had 814 births in 2022. So just putting that into perspective, that's around 80 new souls in our community being affected by withdrawal symptoms um, just as they're born. 
To help children and to ensure our community will thrive, we have to help the family unit. We know that that is a value of Rowan County. We want to see healthy families. And I want to commend, Judy, I, I put this in here, the commissioners for their work on funding local Triple P, that positive parenting program uh, with agencies like the Terry Hess Child Advocacy Center and Partners in Learning. This is one key step in, for helping teach parents emo emotional regulation practices for healthier parenting. For those parents addicted to substances, there is hope and help. Pregnancy and the years of early childhood are key times where we can intervene in these people's lives, where it can be easier to get them help. Outcomes of dual treatment studies, where we have both positive parenting and parental substance use treatment, um, have been shown to have a great reduction in child maltreatment. So from the economic perspective of this, as we see expanded Medicaid, we expect to see more citizens having access to 30-day inpatient treatment programs. Programs cost on average between $5,000 and $20,000 per stay. So that is a huge economic burden um, that will hopefully be helped as we see that expansion happen. Um, it often leads to people not receiving services during that critical time for inability to pay. And instead, we end up seeing these people in our emergency departments. We see those children being born addicted to substances. Um, and eventually, we see abuse and neglect and maltreatment. With the expansion of the certificate of need, we will finally see more providers to ensure there is more space for patients. And the health department will be closely monitoring this in Rowan, as we hope to see the benefit that other states have seen. Uh, one example in Virginia, within the first year, they saw a 79% increase in people receiving care through addiction treatment um, in that first year alone. So with both treatment and parent, or parenting support, uh, our hope is that we continue to see those positive impacts with decreases to child maltreatment and an improvement in our core family units here in Rowan County. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm gonna turn it over to our wonderful DSS director, uh, Ms. Micah Ennis. Thank you, Board of Commission. We know that children are safer when their families have needed resources. The economic programs that our department administers are of critical importance in the larger scheme of child abuse prevention. I think most of us get that if our basic needs aren't met, we're going to struggle with tasks that are outside survival. It's difficult for us to fathom that here in our hometown, in our Rowan, some of our neighbors are faced with just that reality. Poverty does not cause abuse or neglect. I want to be clear about that. But it does add a layer of complication for folks who really want the best for their families, but they don't know how to make it happen. One of the things that this board does diligently and frequently is you're working all the time on economic development. You're working to make sure there's jobs out there for folks. Some of the folks that we serve aren't ready to work for whatever reason, for a variety of reasons, some of which uh, my colleagues have spoken about. Nearly 50,000 Rowan County residents receive Medicaid. About half that receive food and nutrition services, which is AKA food stamps. Um, and and as, as Ms. Harris mentioned, <clears throat> uh, Medicaid expansion will see more of our citizens receiving Medicaid. The 2023 poverty guideline for a family of three is just under $25,000. We know that renting a safe place to live is going to cost at least half that, right, for a family. And, and I think most of us, even the savviest of us, would have trouble making do for a family of three on twice that amount. So I just want to share that with you. Um, I recently read a quote from Cheryl Sandberg. She is a philanthropist and a former tech company executive. She says, we cannot change what we are not aware of. And once we are aware, we cannot help but change. On behalf of Rowan County DSS, I want to thank our community child protection team for coordinating many voices and areas of expertise to help us protect children in our Rowan. I also want to thank our partners in other county departments, as well as our county manager and the Honorable Board of Commissioners. It is a collaborative effort, and with your support and partnership, with your leadership, we have hope of changing the outcomes for the better. Thank you. Hey, Micah. Um, 
I appreciate your report and we at some point have looked at these poverty levels and um, you know, be better jobs do help folks. Yes. We, we sit here a little frustrated at times because we hear these numbers that persist. And so our, my simple question to you, I think we would all wanna know what more, you know, can the board do um, we've we struggle with poverty uh, years we've we've cut that significantly but we're kind of on the threshold of a whole lot of jobs uh, Jim and I were uh, on a zoom call with a company coming here where their starting salary is forty four thousand dollars so how do we get these folks that are still, in poverty, $25,000 for a family of three. Um, we know that there are exceptions to the rule. There are folks in poverty for reasons, you know, but there are a lot who aren't. How do we connect these folks with opportunity that is now at our doorstep and available to folks? That is an amazing question. And the fact that you're asking it, I think, Mr. Chairman, is a great step. I think we really probably should put together a team to study this, right? Get together and determine what's going on with our citizens. Because I don't know all the answers. I know some folks struggle with substance use disorders. I know some folks struggle with mental health disorders. I know some folks don't have examples to follow. Uh, when it comes to, you know, working in the community. I know some folks don't have an effective bridge from poverty, right? I need childcare uh, to, to get me by, you know, uh, until those things I know about, but I know what I know about is just a fraction. I know that there are really smart people uh, who could help us look at that. And I would love to, to, maybe this is a project that we need to look at ongoing. How do we help build that bridge? What are are maybe there's some programs out there in other counties in other states that are working that we could look at and perhaps determine would that work for Rowan County? I would love to see that, Mr. Chairman. And I just think, again, the question itself, I think that should be the leading edge of our work together is what's going on exactly here and how can we partner uh, in this community? We do a lot of folks who care. Uh, as, you, as you've heard, Community Child Protection Team, I know would love to be a part of that conversation as well. Um, <clears throat> I've got two questions and I want to shut up. Uh, 50,000 people on Medicaid, <clears throat> is, is, is that adults or is that family? Individuals, all individuals. So it's about, I think the exact number, I think I said nearly, so it's around, I think it's 40. 47.5, I believe was the last number that I received was 40, about 47.5. And those are individual beneficiaries, children and adults. So the children have to qualify as well as adults? Or are you saying these are 25,000 families with two kids or what? These are almost 50,000 individual beneficiaries, children and adults, all Medicaid beneficiaries, are right around, I think, 47,500 in Rowan County. So yes, each individual has to meet their own qualifications, right? But yes, these are, this number is for individual beneficiaries, not cases. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> in, in these areas that, that we're talking about today, um, do we track children of abuse and children of poverty and how, how that affects, let's say, our graduation, <clears throat> our graduation rate uh, as they go through school? I do not track that. I'm not sure that somebody doesn't in some fashion or another. I think that is something we could talk to our partners with this school system about. I do know, um, I do know that of all the children in foster care today, if we take a, a snapshot of the children in foster care today, there's about 182 children currently in the department's custody. 65% of those were below the poverty level when they entered foster care. That's a lot. 
Um, and so now again, careful to say, uh, poverty doesn't cause abuse and neglect. We know that, but it is a complicating factor. But in terms of graduation rates, we could look at our own population of children in foster care and easily determine what our graduation rates are. Uh, but I'm not sure overall of kids who've been served in any way by our system, what their graduation rates are. But I would be willing to look into that. Well, I, I just assume that, that we have somewhere around 20,000 kids, if we've got 50,000 people involved in that, and or a similar, you know, even if it's a down as little as 15,000, that's still a huge number of kids. And <clears throat> it would seem to me that, that we should track that and see what we can do for those folks. If they are having uh, an adverse, you know, uh, adverse effect on the graduation rate, because like to have it at 100%, but it's not that way in the county. Um, but it seems to me that, that we should know what we're doing is having some effect and whether it's not having an effect on, on kids as they go through school. Again, a great question. Thank you. We get a brochure from you guys, and I, I should have brought it with me, but the budget that comes into Rowan County, that is, and in, in it's, it's, we could do a pie chart or a bar graph or whatever, but isn't it around $250 million that comes into Rowan County to deal with this? Yes. Now, uh, yes. part of that is... Medicare? Medicaid. Is it just, it's not Medicare, but it's Medicaid. Correct. So is that quarter of a billion dollars that is for services for these families that we're talking about? Yes. Those specifics are, those programs, there's a, a lot of what we call pass-through dollars, right? So food nutrition services and Medicaid dollars federal dollars that flow through Rowan County, through our department in terms of we determine eligibility for folks. We case manage their cases for Medicaid and food and nutrition services, child care services, all of those things. Um, but the Medicaid and food and nutrition, that money passes through us. Um, and we see it in our local doctor's offices and in our grocery stores and that kind of thing here in Rowan County. And I, I I wish that I could remember the number right off the top of my head like you did. So I'm afraid to I well, I can't, say, I can't break it. I can't break it down. I've got that brochure, in yes. fact, in my office. Our annual report. Is that yeah, what you refer to? Yeah, I was just shocked at how much money for a county our size yes. pours in. I mean, when you consider our county's budget is $190 million, <laughs> but just for social services, we're spending $250 million. It is staggering, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and as well, we're, we're suffering through a tough economy now, but we've had good economies. And I think everyone looks forward to what we've kind of labeled ourselves as, you know, the dividend. When does the dividend of um, higher paying jobs, opportunity, these things, when do we see that kick in and we... I mean, we understand now why we're, we're on south side of COVID and, um, and all of that, but uh, ho hopefully better days are coming for all of us across the country and the world. But in Rowan County, it's a particularly bright time, I think, right around the corner. So how do we can, well, it's back to our original question, which we may have to talk about over lunch sometime if you'd like to buy. And um, Absolutely. Mr. County Manager, will yeah. buy. Yeah, he's already grumbling. No, you can't do that. So I'll <laughs> I'll pay for my own. Um, but yeah, we we would like to figure out how do we connect those. You know, a few years ago, uh, we we uh, wasn't our idea, but Ron uh, Cabarrus Community College has got the Manufacturers Institute, which we have funded, 
And so folks can go through that free over the last couple of years. You essentially could go to run Cabarrus for free, I think is what I've heard. And so how do we begin to pass that dividend along so that we're not dealing with these issues of, uh, of, of poverty? We will always have poverty. We understand that. But um, $25,000 for a family of three should, and again, some exceptions, this should not be a story any longer. So how do we get those folks hooked up to opportunity? Because it is an exciting time. So maybe we can have, have that conversation sometime. I'd like that. I think we could work together in this community to connect some of the dots. There are a lot of great resources and maybe we just need to open some pathways between those resources, some communication, gather data along the way uh, so that we can continue to support programs that work. Yeah. Well, thank you. Just one follow-up. Um, Commissioner Green was asking about um, individuals on Medicaid. I think it was, right, Jim? Yeah. So I think maybe a clearer picture would be what percent are children, what percent are adults? And I do not know that off the top of my head, but I'm sure that it's a greater percentage of children yeah. uh, than it is adults because the criteria for adults is at this point in time, prior to Medicaid expansion is a lot more uh, steep. The, yeah. the criteria is tougher to meet. Great, thanks. Are you the last speaker? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Very good. All right, so uh, do we have a motion to accept the report as uh, presented? All right, a second, all, right, all in favor say aye. Aye. And then we're gonna vote on a proclamation. Uh, Commissioner Klusman. Proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. Whereas child maltreatment is a community problem and finding a solution depends upon involvement among people throughout the community. And whereas child maltreatment occurs when parents find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and unable to cope. And whereas Approximately 93,193 children were subject of investigations of abuse, neglect, and or dependency in North Carolina in the fiscal year of 2021, and whereas 45 children were victims of homicide by their parent or caretaker in North Carolina during the year of 2021, and whereas the majority of child maltreatment cases stem from situations and conditions that are preventable in an engaged and supportive community. And whereas the effects of child maltreatment are felt by whole communities and need to be addressed by the entire community. And whereas effective child maltreatment prevention programs succeed because of partnerships created among social service agencies, schools, faith communities, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. Therefore, the Rowan County Commissioners do hereby proclaim April 2023 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Rowan County and calls upon all citizens, community agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, and businesses to increase their participation in our efforts to prevent child maltreatment and strengthen the communities in which we live. This the third day of April, 2023, and I offer that as a motion. All right, do we have a second? Second, Craig. All right, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye, any opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. And I'll look forward to lunch. All right, uh, Anna. Going to talk about the airport. Yes. So, um, as we are moving forward with the hangar project, um, it is time to hold a public hearing and do the findings resolution um, for the LGC application regarding this project. Um, so, I believe the current estimate is at twelve point six million dollars. We have three million in skip funding um, for this project, and then a million set aside um, from the sales tax for public safety from that portion. 
So we need to finance approximately um, $8.7 million for this project. And um, so I just, we need to hold the public hearing and, and move forward with that. Any questions? Yeah, does that include the 5 million that was uh, given to us by the state for the uh, highway patrol hangar? So that's where the three million is coming from. So the state gave us five million. We're using three for the hangar and two for instru the instrument okay, project. That, so ask. that's where that three million in SCIF money is coming okay. from. Question. Is the uh, the um, a million from the quarter cent, that's a one-time drawdown. So, yes, but we can also look at paying a portion of the debt service from that money going forward to, I believe, this. So the bids are out. Um, they did ask that the due date be postponed until April 27th. So... Um, this probably, I think at the time I was working on all this, these bids were going to be coming in next week. And so that's why I was like, we've got to get this handled. Um, but we still have to do this step in order to do the application. So, All right. Well, we will open the floor to a public hearing now uh, for the installment financing for the airport hangars. Anyone have anything to speak on on this? All right, then we'll close the public hearing. And uh, Jay and um, Sarah, do we need to um, just name the resolution or do we have to read all of this? All right, uh, make a motion that we authorize, um, uh, that we pass a resolution authorizing the filing of an application for approval of an installment finance contract authorized by North Carolina General Statute 160A-20 and making certain findings required by North Carolina General Statute 159-151. All right, any other discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. All right, well, that's exciting. Um, some good things happening out at the airport. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would just like for us to make some comments, you or Greg, Craig, <clears throat> about the importance of these hangars and um, how many folks we have in line to, to use these things, because most of the, the public's not familiar with, with uh, the demand uh, for these hangars, if, if uh, two of you don't mind taking a minute. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Mr. Green, for opening the door on that. I wanted to say a few things that if we're going to grow this county and we're going to bring industry here, we've got to be up to speed with transportation needs. Corporate America does not drive anywhere anymore. They fly. And one of the big things that we've accomplished over the past 12 years with our first corporate hangar is we have been able to not only bring new business here, but we've been able to maintain businesses like Food Line and Shoe Show and these kind of places. But what's not being talked about, and, and, and I'll yield to Chairman Ed's, we have a company called Arrowwood that's coming here that's going to take one of those hangars immediately to move his operation here, which is charter, airplane sales, um, detailing, uh, and flight school. So we're not just building these on a hope and a prayer. We already have people that are ready to occupy these hangars. We were able to move Food Line out of their old hangar into the first corporate hangar that we built, and it's been able to stabilize, making sure that they would be here. So this is not just we want to go build hangars. We have customers waiting for these hangars. And I'm not talking about somebody flying a Piper Cub. I'm talking about Jared Aircraft that increase our tax base tremendously not only that, but the fuel sales that they generate, generate a lot of money for the airport, which enables us to continue to, to grow our airport and to be able to, to bring these corporations here. And, and proof positive, and, and Chairman Edge was res responsible for most of this, was Arrowwood. When they decided to come here, 
they came to us. We didn't go after them because they knew that the potential of what Rowan now has or mid Carolina, excuse me. Um, Charlotte is built out, Concord is built out, we're next in line. And you'd be surprised at the number of, air, of aircraft that are in our hangars now that are from Cabarrus County, simply because it's easier to come here than it is to try to get to your airplane in Concord and get in line to take off. So, so this is not something that we're doing just to go spend some money. This is something because we have the demand here and this is what's gonna grow our county into the future. Well, thanks. Um, it is an exciting time at the airport. Uh, Airwood Aviation, um, they're already on, um, on site, right? So yeah. They are. They have very unique sets of all days. One CDO, but they're each divided under their own companies. Airwood would break the piece. Would you come up? Would you come up? Let's start over. Sorry. Caught me off guard. Sorry. That's all right. So uh, Airwood and Charter Jet Transport are kind of one and the same. Charter Jet Transport is the piece that we already have on site at the airport, which is a management company. So someone who owns an aircraft can let them manage their aircraft for them. Um, they can choose, do they want a pilot to fly with them? Do they want to fly their own aircraft? They get the maintenance done through them and they can also charter their aircraft out to individuals, um, either with their own pilots or charter jets pilots. Um, when Airwood fully moves here, uh, the variety of things they will bring is maintenance. They will bring uh, hopefully a 141 flight school. Uh, they will bring the Charlotte Hornets travel component. It's not the team travel, but it is all the travel that's associated with the various components outside of when the team actually travels to a game. I didn't know if we were gonna say that out loud. <laughs> Have they made that public? Yes. Yeah, so that's exciting and I'll restate it. Um, Airwood Aviation is now the official charter service. Um, and so if you're, so for families and of, um, of um, Charlotte Hornets folks, right? That's my understanding for the families and the corporate entities and all of the employees, but I, with them not being at the airport yet, I haven't seen how that component actually works. Yeah, so um, they will now, uh, that, that relationship between Airwood Aviation and the Charlotte Hornets uh, will now move to Rowan County. And so that's pretty cool. Might be a great story for the post. Uh, we can get you in touch with Brandon from Airwood, but I, I do believe that announcement's been made. So that's big for Rowan County. I wish we had a picture of the hangar that we're building for him. It'll be, it'll be something new for Rowan County. It'll look really great. Uh, it'll be a real asset for us. And then, um, we were able to get through uh, Carl Ford, Senator Carl Ford secured $5 million for Rowan County Airport. A couple million of it is going for um, our ILS system. Without an instrument landing system, it's really difficult to have people in your hangars. If they can't come in and BFR is visual, but if they can't come in IFR conditions where you can't see weather, uh, we don't have a very good system for the larger aircraft to come in. To touch on one thing you mentioned with Concord being built out, Charlotte Mecklenburg's being built out and they're trying to expand. With these five hangars, we will basically use all of the land that we currently have access to from our taxiway. Right. So that's some of the things that we've been talking about is getting a parallel taxiway so we can expand to the area. We do have more land, we just hard to get to it with an airplane if you don't have a taxiway. So these five hangars will take up the remaining block of land that we currently have ramp and taxiway access to. Yeah, so what Carl was able to help us with, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Ford was able to help us with is uh, we have helicopters down in what we kind of call corporate row. And frankly, the uh, jet owners would not like helicopters kicking up dust and debris. So we are moving, um, the helicopters we have are for Novant and also for uh, Highway Patrol. And so Highway Patrol has been talking about additional units. And so uh, we're moving them uh, quite a ways down uh, the runway and building a, a public safety hangar. And that is uh, how Senator Ford was able to help us out with that. 
that opens up a big, big 15,000 square foot corporate hangar for us for, for growth. And then three smaller hangars, I think those are 6,000. They're about 65 by 65, 66 by 66, okay. depending. Um, and currently as the FBO, the fixed space operator, the county, we do not have hangar space to us, which is unique. Most FBOs would have someone who's transient, flies in for a couple of days, says, can you put my airplane in your hangar? Right now we don't. So hopefully through this whole process, we'll be able as the county to get some hangar space back so that we do have the ability to overnight large aircraft that come in. Um, and that's how a lot of airports can make a lot of money. When you fly in in a large jet, they don't think very much of having to pay a large sum for an overnight fee. Yeah, so as we talk about expanding to the west side of the airport, which, which is where all of our land is, the comments from FAA and those folks are, well, you still have space on the east side. Well, now not anymore. And so some of us were up in Raleigh a couple of weeks ago and met with our legislators. And I believe a project for Roanne was added to the DOT list uh, where we're trying to get uh, full funding for that uh, parallel taxiway. So anyway, um, uh, as always, a long answer uh, if I'm involved, but uh, thank you, Craig. And um, this is an exciting time for Run County and uh, in our airport, so thanks. All right, uh, Ann um, is gonna talk to us about, Ann, Ann Randy, about grant program proposal. This is this is great. We're finally here. <laughs> yeah, good. All right, so I'll start off and then I'll uh, let Ann tell you a little bit about the grant, but just to give, the, uh, well, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so when Northeast Water System came online. Can you pull that mic up? We, yes. It's hard to hear you. When Northeast Water System came online, as part of the process, um, there's sampling of the water at the different locations and Northeast Water System has just under 450 customers. So it's a relatively very small system. Through that sampling process, lead was found in the water. This kicked off a whole long process with the state uh, issuing notice of violation for that. So we've moved through a lot of different steps here, um, including the change in the chemical that's being used by Salisbury Rowan Utilities. Uh, that was after going through processes uh, with Virginia Tech and also implemented and have completed the chemical booster station. And that was completed and is operational earlier this calendar year. Through this process, we recognize that the homes themselves is where the source of lead was. It wasn't through the supply from SRU. It wasn't through the, the piping that goes to the home. It's actually in the home. Uh, so the, uh, the board had directed an effort for staff to develop a solution to eliminate that source of lead. Uh, this process is new. Uh, it's not something we can clone from somewhere else. We have a small system, so it's actually feasible to do. Uh, so we have looked at various different processes, and fortunately, with Ann coming on as grants director and Craig Powers coming on um, as director of engineering from Salisbury, he had a great idea after we were looking at how to do this from construction cost, and after review, coming up with a grant program reduces risk for the county. Jay's looked at this. Uh, we've, all, we've had plenty of staff looking at different opportunities here of how this can be done. Uh, so what we'll be proposing is the grant opportunity to allow anyone that still has any lead that's not been remediated by the, the changing chemical or the chemical booster station uh, to look at a plumbing replacement through this grant opportunity. This does not utilize county general fund dollars. It does utilize the ARPA fund dollars, so we're able to take advantage of that. Um, and I'm happy to say that the process that's already been in place with the changing chemical in the booster station, the last two six month periods, we have been in compliance. Now, again, that's a sampling of the home. So that doesn't mean everybody, um, there still could be homes there. We, and there's still some that we've definitely seen a change from homes that were in the non-compliant to now a compliant state. Um, so we've developed the grant program to be as easy as uh, possible. And that was in your packet. Um, to make this where the individual can work with a 
you know, plumbing contractor, we utilize the same procurement policy we have with the county, providing multiple quotes, make sure that they're um, licensed and look at the best cost for that. So, Anne, I, uh, if you want to mention anything about the grant or is there anything you'd like to mention? Um, just that we've worked to, um, there's two potential, two potential ARPA related funds that this could come from. One is through the DEQ, the 1.9 million appropriation that is still working its way through the system. Um, but also there's the direct ARPA funding as well. And I don't know that we have a anticipated cost as of yet, but with the improvements that have been made to the system already, we don't anticipate the cost to be very high. Um, but my main role has been to make, make sure that we can spend funding out of these two potential two potential funds. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so Anne's made sure that we're doing the right thing, uh, appropriate use of you know spending uh, dollars that the county has for this process. Again, the grant program is something new, this process of remediating um, lead and interior plumbing is pretty much new nationwide. So uh, checking and making sure that we've done all of our homework, uh, providing a program. So the, the process here is if the original individuals uh, and, and homeowners that have gone through the voluntary sampling, um, we had had that program out to understand how we can help with water, um, Brita filters, things like that, to ensure that they're not drinking you know, contaminated water. We've gone through that process. And we have a list, so once this grant opens up, we'll be contacting anyone that was originally in that list and go through the process of having an additional testing. Some of this has already been done and some of that risk review has already occurred. So the goal here is to have testing prior, go through a plumbing replacement for those that would like to take advantage of that and then do post-testing to ensure that we have remediated the issue. Um, so I think the process itself, we are aligning it with the ARPA timeline. So it would be opened up. We would have information on the website um, and also the application, which is a pretty short form application. Just who you are, are you a Northeast Water System customer? We'll work with those individuals uh, to make sure they have their sampling and everything there. This is not a competitive grant in any way, shape or form. This is a pay for the homes that have the issue. Um, just want to make that clear that we're, you're not in a you know, a competition to see, you know, and have approval. We will be, for each individual um, homeowner that has this process, we will be bringing back and probably putting on consent um, those items, you know, for those grant approvals for that. So we'll go through our normal procurement process, make sure that they meet all the requirements. They have the plumbing uh, contractor lined up, approve that process, and then they'll be able to start work. And then once they complete and the invoice comes in, um, we'll remit payment to that homeowner. Randy, you in, in our packet, it said uh, recently the EPA created a trigger level for lead and drinking water. Um, they moved it from 50 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion. Do you know when that was and is I do not. I, don't I, I, I mean, I'm going to say it was a couple years ago. I'm looking at you. Well, I just, I'm trying. I mean, I, I just wonder if our problem got bigger. Oh, we were we Most. were already looking at ten parts per billion um, to begin with. Okay. Yes. I just wondered yes, if we if we had four hundred homes and uh, we thought we had twenty five that were a problem, and then with this rule change, it went to four hundred. I but we were already looking. We were at already 10. looking at the more aggressive ten parts per billion. Yes. Okay. Randy, if uh, if these houses are replumbed, will we still have to have the injector in place? Well, we will have the, ch the change in chemical is there. The biggest issue that with the chemical booster station is providing now is regulating the pH in the water. So yes, the, the chemical booster station will still be needed. It's not required that we maintain a pH level. My well doesn't have a pH level indicator on it. There, there are tests that uh, Salisbury Rowing Utilities has to do as our owner operator. And so there does, we have to maintain a certain level of pH that comes out of the water distribution system. 
Well, I guess my question is, did we not put the cart before the horse? Should we not have replumbed the houses and not have to spend almost a million dollars for this booster station? The, um, if I may answer yeah, that. I just wanted the, to answer. The replumbing the houses was never an option in so far as a, the regulatory compliance. I'm not saying that makes any sense, but that that was the rule. So if, and for us to to come into compliance, we had to have a booster pump station. You're right. It doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, kind of the way that the it's based on the way the the rules look at it. And most systems aren't this small. Most systems couldn't fix the problem by replacing the plumbing. So the only real feasible alternative for most water systems would be to inject certain chemicals and to increase that and the pH level. So, my, but they, the state doesn't really care what our size is. What we're doing now uh, with, with this is, is just something extra. I mean, this, this in no way meets compliance. Now, if, if the, we replace all the the lines that have lead, and then we are in compliance. I mean that within itself helps us get there. But um, what the state wanted is a is a action plan, and the action plan was the booster pump station, and it has helped. It, it, we're 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 in compliance now, based on the booster pump station. Well, if we're in compliance, why are we replumbing people's houses in? Well, because we had. At the time, we had initially uh, talked about doing that as a, as a matter of public safety uh, and to, to make sure that the, our citizens, you know, on that water line have the safest water as, as possible. So we weren't sure uh, whether or not the booster pump station was going to work. Um, at the time, it, you know, it was a, it was, it, it's kind of like a, you know, if you have a disease and the doctor writes a prescription, um, just taking the prescription got us in compliance. Whether or not it works, worked or not was a different matter. And I, it happened to work. We still have, I think in our last sample, there was one house that was out of, that, that was out of compliance, right? Yeah, we, we don't, I don't think we have, I, well, I, I'm not going to speak to it without looking at it, but yes, we, to, in total, we're in compliance, but we do still have lead. It, it takes a period of time for this chemical coating to work, and you, so you'll slowly start to see a decline, or actually two years, I think, is what we've had. In that part. Compliance is 90%. Yes. The, yeah. So th this actually eliminates this. This meets the original intent of looking at a lead-free solution um, for the homes. And again, this this is all voluntary. The sampling uh, the sampling isn't a taking everyone's homes. This is just taking the samples that meet certain types of home structure, um, year built, things like that. You say there's 450 houses on this line? There's 444 customers. Okay. How yes. many of them, though, have already been replumbed? By the, because I have friends that live down there, and they replumbed their houses years ago that don't have lead. So how many houses are we looking at plumbing? Honestly, I, the numbers would be relatively low. The original review that we had that was even showing above from the voluntary sampling was 12. And that's now decreased from there. So that was the ones that had 10 parts per billion or higher. And some had extremely high, 350 plus. Um, we know the chemical has worked. We've seen the reports back, you know, showing that decrease. There still could be some there. Again, this is just volunteer. This does, uh, I mean, the, the homeowner still has to actually go through a process, do the voluntary sampling, make sure. So if you did have, you know, plumbing replacement, you don't have lead that's detectable from that voluntary test, that's part of the eligibility for the grant program. Okay, I just want to have accurate information. And when I hear 444 houses, and I know good and well, not all of them meet this. That, that is correct. There, that's the reason within the grant program, there is an eligibility of having 
for those that have not already gone through a voluntary sampling, and again, to ones that know that they have their house replumbed, um, they're probably not even going to take advantage of this, but if there's a concern, and we already have the water test kits uh, on hand for that as well. And there has been, we have had public um, conversation about those that would like to go through this process. So yeah, to answer your question, no, there, this is not any intent that there's going to be a total 445 individuals that would even look at this. This is for those use cases that they're already aware that they had, um, you know, compliance issues, or they may not know that they have a compliance issue because they didn't go through the initial voluntary sampling. When will we have an accurate number? The only way we can have a fully accurate number of all 445 is if all 445 went through voluntary sampling. Um, I don't think we'll see that. But that, that is the only way to have it. it. The whole process of going through and having the, the water test is voluntary. So if we make this voluntary test available and not everybody tests, and we start this grant process and we go in and let's say we plumb 150 houses, just as a random number. And then they come back five years later and say, well, you know, I got high lead content in my house. Where, where do we draw the line of, We've done everything we can do. Either you get on board or you're, you're left yes. off. Yes, sir. We've actually tied this particular grant program to the ARPA funding and ARPA deadlines. Um, so we do have listed in the grant program. Grant will open it at, uh, upon board approval and will go through uh, June 30 of 2024. I think we have some provisions in that the board could hear um, those that, that, that would be the application deadline, okay. but we're tying this to the ARPA funding that's from the, the federal dollars. So will they receive notification in the mail explaining all this? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the owners as well as the tenants. What this would be was we would put this into the mailing that goes for the bill payments. Bill. Yeah, and it would need to be the homeowner um, or that would have to go through this process. Like if you were a renter, you would need the, your, your homeowner to actually do the application for that because they would be the one that would authorize the repair work. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I'm with Craig. I feel like we're in a pickle now. <laughs> um, hmm. Does this... Is there a is is there a date here that we have to be doing this tonight? This is a completely optional program. Um, this is not an enforcement by the state. Uh, it is optional for Rowan County to pursue. Yeah, this is over and above any state requirements. So, so as I understand it. We have the Duke issue. Part of the settlement was that these, these folks, mainly on Dukeville Road, there may be some outside of that, right? Yes. Right. Um, they, they need, they, it was required that they be provided clean water. So we ran lines along, and Duke paid for it ran lines down Long Ferry Road, we hooked them up. The folks that most likely have lead problems, there, there was a change in the law. It seems to me like it was 1986, but it was mid 80s, somewhere around there. EPA or the federal government, some agency said you can't use certain uh, types of um, products in your plumbing. And so at that point, probably folks who had houses built after that point aren't having this issue because they don't have those chemicals in their, those, uh, in their, their pipes. But those that were built prior to that change could. And so we're not necessarily, are we testing all of those folks whose homes were built prior to that change? Everything at this time has, well, in it, I think it only can be that it's voluntary that the individuals would have to take the free water testing kit and go through that process. Um, now, keep it bear in mind if if they do present that water test, which we did go through that process 
earlier on, uh, that's when we did recognize that there were others that weren't in the sampling that actually goes to the state. So whenever we do a volunteer sampling for a homeowner, that result is also submitted to the state and counts toward that particular six month window. But when you, so these folks, let's say one of their houses built in 1952, they perhaps the rules were like they are now when you move into a new house and you you put down a well, you have to have water sampling, right? So I would let's assume that was going on in 1952. There were new pipes, they did a water sample, everything's fine, no lead. They've not had that water tested since 1952, right? We could probably, I mean, for the most part, there's nothing in the law that says they have to have that water tested every year. So they, but the only reason they got tested is because they went on a new water system. Yes, sir. So, we, so uh, some of them, probably we would say confidently, the ones that were built prior to the change in law are the ones that are having the problem. In order for um, us to comply with this new water line, the state says, well, you're going to have to build a pump station and put chemicals in the water that's going to coat their lines, and hopefully they won't have this leaking of leaching of lead any longer. We didn't, in fact, we may have argued with them. We're not sure if that's even going to help. And they said, doesn't matter, spend a million dollars anyway. Am I right? Well, at the time we were using a, we were using um, Virginia Tech. Yeah, but I think we were using one type of phosphate. Maybe it was poly, poly orthophosphate and they wanted us to change to zinc orthophosphate. And we couldn't change until Salisbury changed. They did. They did, but it, it took quite some time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, the our folks were, were our position was is that raising the level wouldn't work. We needed to switch the chemical. But we didn't know it was going to work. So, Craig, this is where. Right. We on a second on a different track, we're thinking the only way to really fix this is the there's only one other way, and that's to replace people's plumbing, right? Yeah. And so now we find out it's worked for a lot of houses. Maybe it's not worked for all. And so now Craig raises a great question: is if we fixed all the houses, do we have to keep this pump station going? Do they have to keep treating? I don't know. And so I, we're, we, it, it's like he said. Yes, y yes you do. You have to keep, keep it going? Yes. Because, it, yeah, because it's, it's, it's the, uh, it is what's required uh, by the regulation to be in compliance. Okay. We, we were, we were afraid it wouldn't work because we'd already been using you know, I think it's called poly or it's been a while, poly orthophosphate. But yeah, you know, and everybody said, well, why not just replace the, the lines in the houses? Because there's not that many houses that, you know, need to be replaced. And remember, we we did free sampling for everybody and gave, you know, I think it was a month's credit on their water bill. Um, you know, even then we couldn't get everybody to, to, to take the sample. So I think there's only about 12 folks that would be eligible uh, unless some folks start testing that would, didn't test back then. But yeah, I mean, if, if we replaced them all, we would still have to, to do that. And, and Chairman, at the time, if you recall, people were switching from their wells, they weren't using the water. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, we had people out there sure. that weren't using the water. And to make the phosphate, the orthophosphate or the new chemical work, they had to flush through their system. And so the concern with regard to the replacement versus waiting to see if this worked had a lot to do with at the time. And in that window, um, we weren't sure people were really using the water enough, even with the chemical booster station, to pump enough water through to protect those lines because they were having to pay for water for the first time. So they were going easy on the water. Concerned that they may have hooked their well back up. We, we just didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I guess. But, uh, but anyway, so in that window of time when the state, and if you remember, we were pushed up against a deadline yeah. 
Um, and uh, it was a pretty frantic deadline. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, it was, it, it's an interesting response from the people at the state that they didn't really want us to replace plumbing because they wouldn't have a sample um, to test the water. <laughs> so try to figure out the logic. Um, but what we were sitting around as staff, we were looking at it and going, you know, we've got this eight or $900,000 pump station coming. We don't know if the chemical is going to work. Virginia Tech says it's going to work, um, but we don't know if people are using enough water. We don't know what's going to happen. And for these 10 or 12 homes that were identified, um, you know, we sat around and said, really, I mean, wouldn't it be easier just to dig it up and replace it? And it's not as easy as that, but, yeah. but certainly that was a big concern at the time was, are they using enough? I think what we're seeing is that the numbers are getting Oh, the, it, it's better. The chemical so, is definitely working for those yeah. that are utilizing the, the water. Hey, <clears throat> for everybody that went on the system, didn't Duke Power have to pay their water bill for 25 years? Front settlement. Front settlement that took an average and paid it for what was estimated to be 25 years. Right. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, what do we want to do? Do we want to? Want some answers? Yeah. Questions. I guess the fundamental question is if, if, I mean, Aaron, I guess the, the question that was on the table is do you have to do anything tonight or do you want more information with regard to the program? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, you don't have to do anything tonight. I mean, if you want, if you want us to do more research and bring you more information, we can. If, if you want us to move forward, we, we can do that too, but we're not. As I understand it, we're not required to do this. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've had my questions answered. Okay. I'm, I'm good with go ahead and voting and go ahead and implementing this program and let's take care of our citizens. All right. Make a motion. <clears throat> so moved. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you guys. Thanks, Randy. Good yeah, job. thank you. And you're up again. Welcome back. <laughs> Well, good okay. news. Hopefully this will be a little easier. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this time to give you an update on this proposal. Um, to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, to lease space over in West End Plaza once it's renovated. Okay, so if you recall, the board first approved submitting a proposal to the USDA on August 15th, 2022 at the regular meeting. And that lease proposal was in response to a request for lease proposals that the USDA had put out specifying that they wanted to lease space in Rowan County. So the two offices in question, the Farm Services Agency office is county level USDA office. It covers Rowan County, although I believe the director oversees both Rowan and Cabarrus counties. They currently have five employees who would move to West End Plaza, and they're currently leasing space um, with Rowan County on out on Old Concord Road. And excuse me, Ann. Yes. Uh, the amount of the rent they're paying for the uh, the FSA right now is uh, $15,912 a year. A year. Oh, sorry, Ann. That's okay. I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, the other office in question is the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the NRCS. They're currently leasing space with a private entity downtown in downtown Salisbury. They are regional and they generally aren't open to the public. They're, they currently have about eight people who would be moving over to the USDA offices. Um, and so the idea from the USDA is that they want to do both of these offices under a single lease, so consolidate that. So the proposal, you have it in your packet, the details, um, but the summary of that, the initial proposal back in August was the straight shell rate, you see here, that $17 per rentable square foot, that RSF. Um, and that would have been an annual rental revenue of uh, about 88,200. Then, so what's changed, and I've worked with the uh, kind of 
in my communication with the USDA real estate specialist. We've identified some additional areas or just additional costs that could be included in the proposal. First off, this 675,000 build out costs, which is from the quote through ADW. What that is, is the cost for the 5,189 square feet of space that the USDA would be moving into. Um, that's the cost for build out and renovation, kind of basically up to the walls and, and all that. Um, so for those renovations, we're proposing to amortize that over 10 years at a 7% interest rate which gives us this $18.12 for the annual rent for, per square foot. Uh, base rate is the same, the $17. And then the operating costs, you also have that in your packet. It's based on estimates of current operating costs out there with the understanding that that could change given that they're doing a lot of renovation and the heat and cooling system's gonna be worked on and so on. So what that does is it gives us the annual square foot rate of $48.32 for those 10 years. The total annual rent would be would then come to $250,732 from the USDA. And then just to kind of give you an estimate on that, um, this is rough estimates over the 10 years for years one through five, the total would be about 1.25 million coming in. And years six through 10 show a small increase in the shell rate um, estimated at about 1.28 million. So total rough estimate over 10 years would be about two and a half million. These are just basic calculations. As I said, I haven't run them through any more complex formulas for um, to calculate amortization down to more granular levels, but this, this will give you a good idea of what we're looking at for the proposal. So I'd like to request your approval um, to submit this proposal. Uh, this is basically step two from the process that started back in August. Once the USDA receives our proposal, they'll go through their processes. They'll likely come back with some sort of a counter proposal. Um, the real estate specialist that I worked with did look over the numbers and he's, he seemed to imply that they're pretty well in line with what they would expect to see. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, I'd anticipate that you'll see me coming back asking for more approvals over the next few months. Timeline-wise, we're hoping to have the lease and the rate mutually agreed upon and ready to ready for you to review the final lease uh, sometime around July or August, sometime in there. So, pending any questions, I'd like to ask you to approve the county manager to sign and submit these updated documents to the USDA. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah, has any space been identified where this 5,100 square feet are yes. going to go? Um, if you recall, I don't have the, the schematics at all, but if you recall, we do have space um, across, it's down near the Belk, the old Belk area. And it is across from basically the entire space starting with across from where the veteran services is on down to where the Belk office or the, where the Belk store was. Yeah, I believe that's part of the ag extension yes. offices. It's part of the, the, the renovations. Yep. It's part of what the current renovations are. Okay. So, and my question is, is when you were working with the real estate um, experts, this would be a normal business rate that say if a for-profit business came in and said, we want to rent. A normal to offer them. This, I guess he was mainly looking at the, the shell rate, the $17 per square foot. Mm -hmm. And he said that was right around in line with what they were seeing in this area for a square foot rate. Okay, thanks. So where, where you're talking about is um, taking the space where GQ menswear was. Pardon me? I said, where you're talking about identifying the space is where GQ menswear was and then back toward the, no. the belt. No, it's, uh, 
Uh, on the other side, okay. it's, it, they're kind of going to be sharing it with Cooperative Extension. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just there's 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 some walls. Uh, let's call them firewalls, but they're not. There's some walls to keep them separate from state and feds. And to have their files separate, but other than that, they'll kind of be in the same general area. Okay. I think there was uh, all the floor plan. There was like a little area. Well, the space okay. includes, if I remember, offices, um, restroom space. There's conference rooms. They have the server room specifications. It was all included on that document from ADW. Do you have anything you want to add about your relationship with them? Well, <laughs> the Farm Service Agency is our local uh, county farm service agency, which is utilized by all of our local residents and farmers. Um, and then the other NRCS office was, would be regional, and they want to, USDA wants to combine those two leases. There's about eight people who will be in the regional offices. We do work with those folks in those regional offices, um, but they're statewide, so they are out in the field a lot. So they are in and out, and um, so they don't keep regular office hours. They're not open to the public, but we would utilize their resources. Um, they would be on the farthest end of the plans. When you looked at the schematics, we had not known at that time whether they would be coming over or not. At that time, we still were trying to track down who the USDA real estate people were. Um, but since then, they have decided that it is a much better idea to consolidate their leases. Um, and it works really well for them. Um, the FSA portion would be a part of our ag center suite that is makes it accessible for all of the agricultural offices. Um, and then the, the far end would be the NRCS offices. It is important for those USDA offices have to have a separate entrance um, because of their being on the federal server, they have to um, keep their files locked um, in a certain way. So um, because of that, there, there do have to be some walls like, like Aaron said, but other than that, it's still really all together. Good, mm -hmm. all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Ann? No, no. All right, uh, unless there's any other questions, do we have a motion to, um, ask the county manager to continue to negotiate on our behalf uh, with USDA. I have a question for Amy. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yep. All right, second, go ahead. Okay, so you've been able to connect with the um, farm service mm -hmm. real estate people. So what, just in general, what are they telling you besides that they want this all together for a lease? That's about all. So um, the way the USDA works with their um, buildings is they put out a request for proposals. Um, so anyone in the county could have offered them right. a lease in space. And we had the proposal, which we did back in August um, for them. Um, and then they look at that and they compare those things to what other counties have. Um, when we initially did this, it was during the Trump administration and many of the offices had been moved to Oklahoma. And in fact, we couldn't really track down where the person was that was in charge. And every time I called, no one knew. I, I went around and around. Um, the, our North Carolina person couldn't tell me. And so what we did was measure what we have and gave them a little bit more. When we did finally get in touch with the real estate people, what we found was Miranda, the, the director's office, the office that we drew, that we had given her space for was too big. Um, in comparison to other counties, they felt that she had too much room. Um, so, um, so, but, um, 
if there are no other places for them to go, they're willing to work with the space that they have. So my understanding when we're working with other counties who have gone through this process, it is very long and it's very tedious and that we have to have a lot of patience with USDA. Um, they have a lot of rules and um, guidelines about what they would like um, in their buildings and signage. Um, in the end, it usually all comes out in the favor of the county, but it may take a while to get there. Um, so that is important that we stay, and Anne has been very good to like keep following up um, with this. And she would ask me, have you heard anything? And I'll say no, but my understanding is that's how this works, is they disappear for a while and then they come back. So um, they, they are... The, com the combination of the leases is a good thing, I think. Um, and the more resources we're able to put into the building um, gives us more strength. Um, so um, those regional offices are very, the folks who work there are very excited about being in a building with other agricultural offices. Um, and they would like to be with us and work with us. So they're pushing from their end to make this happen. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I will just um, <clears throat> add that we did two employee houses through the USDA on our farm. And when you're talking about frustrating, it took two years yeah. for each one. Yeah. For each one. Mr. <laughs> so. Kasky, did you have a question? <laughs> okay, okay. All right, we have a motion, motion and a second. Any other discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, any opposed? All right, thank you. All right, um, move on to board appointments. I did let you know about that one that's been uh, added. So let's. Uh, so we've got Board of Adjustments, Town of Rockwell. There's two, uh, two openings. Uh, and Andrew King and uh, Jeremy Linker have applied. We have a motion to approve those two. All right, we motion a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Local emergency. <laughs> they make a designation on their application which one they're applying for. Um, let me see here. Is there. At large and an alternate. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, appoint Jeremy Linker, the at large, and Andrew King, the alternate. All right. Uh, so I'll second that. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. All right. Local Emergency Planning Committee, Eddie Hawks. Uh, he's a safety and environmentalist specialist applied for the environmental health transportation seat. Uh, motion to approve Eddie. So moved. All in favor say aye. aye. Planning board, four applications were received for one at large seats available. Uh, if appointed, the term expires December 31st, 2025. Do we have any motions? Make a motion. Go ahead. Make a motion to appoint Angie Spielman. All right, uh, Angie Spielman, is there a second? All right, uh, do we have uh, any other nominations? I'd, I'd nominate Sean Reed. Second. All right, second. Um, all in favor of Sean Reed, say aye. Aye. All right, uh, Ruin Iredale Volunteer Fire Department Commissioners Jeannie Wooten Weaver applied for county seat. Motion to approve Jeannie. In a second. Aye. All in favor, say aye. aye. Scott's Irish uh, Volunteer Fire Department Commissioners Bernie Jock Davis and David Phillip Majors Jr. applied for two of the three seats that are open. Is this the one that has a third now? Third, Steve third is Steve Simpson. So uh, do we have a um, motion to approve those three? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, I think that's all we have. Um, I have gotten some calls recently about folks interested in getting on board. So, um, you know, get with Sarah, uh, we can call the county clerk's office, also look online. There's a whole list of openings. We're actually getting folks who are applying uh, for boards that there's just not opening. So take another look at some of the boards and 
apply for those, but we appreciate very much your interest and uh, uh, keep working at us. All right, uh, we have a closed session is, uh, let's see. I'd like to make a motion uh, to convene in closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A1 to consider approval of the minutes of the closed session held on February 20th, 2023, um, uh, providing that minutes or an account of closed session may be withheld from public inspection so long as public inspection would frustrate the purpose of a closed session and pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body regarding airport leases. Uh, is there a second? second? All right, so we'll get started as soon as we clear the room. All right, uh, we're out of close session. Do we have a motion to come out of closed session? Second. Our motion is second. Yeah, yeah, motion and a second. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, what was that? Oh. Uh, all right. Have a good night.